Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm continuing my research into using a Raspberry Pi Pico as low capacity data storage for my 6502 computer. Last time we successfully, but slowly, transferred data from the Pico to the 6502. A couple of viewers suggested that I try using the PIO function of the Pico. Wait, what? I have to find out more about this, so why don't you join me as we investigate the Raspberry Pi Pico PIO? What is PIO? It's short for Programmable Input Output and gives the Pico the ability to interface with a wide variety of devices and buses without specialized hardware. Essentially, it's a set of independent processors that handle the finicky timing and formatting required for transferring data between the Pico and other systems. It makes the Pico very flexible and very powerful. We've all used PIO in our normal PCs, whether it's a hard drive interface, a video display, or an Ethernet connection. However, those devices were programmed by the manufacturer and are not usually modified. In contrast, not only does the Raspberry Pi Pico have a number of pre-programmed interfaces such as I2C and SPI, it has also given us the ability to configure our own interfaces. In my last video, I transferred data from the Pico to my 6502 using a process called bit banging, where I used the main processor to turn on and off the Pico's outputs in a specific order to match the format required by the 6502. It worked, but because I was programming in MicroPython, the data transfer speed was pretty slow. I think that using the Pico PIO will improve the data transfer rate. I reviewed the official Pico and RP2040 data sheets and a couple of videos while learning about PIO. It took me quite a while to wrap my head around the concept, but then everything started to click. Let's drill down a little. The RP2040 in the Pico has a main processor with two cores for performing normal controlling and calculating tasks. In addition, it has two little processors for programmable input output. These little processors, or PIO blocks as they're called, operate independently from the main processor. They communicate with the main processor using FIFO or first in first out pipes. Inside each PIO block are four state machines. Don't worry about what state machines are right now, we'll get to that shortly. Anyway, each PIO block has enough memory space for 32 instructions. There are a total of nine different instructions, which include jump, wait, in, out, push, pull, move, interrupt request, and set. At first, it doesn't seem like a lot, but the instructions are optimized for moving data around and the results are very powerful. Now let's talk about the state machines. The four state machines in each PIO block are tiny processors that all run the same program. However, each state machine can access different input and output pins and can be sent different data. For instance, if you needed four different UARTs, you could use the four state machines in one PIO block and just assign different I.O. pins to each. Each state machine has four different sets of GPIO pin mappings, input, output, set, and side set. This seemed confusing to me until I realized that output, set, and side set are similar. They're all just slightly different in how each type of mapping is used in the program. Output data is typically filled as a result of a shift from the output shift register. Set data is often absolute data that has been programmed or calculated. Side set data is like set data except side set can be populated at the same time as other instructions, that is, at the side of the instruction, hence the name. Inputs, of course, are inputs. Each state machine can have 0 to 32 input pins, 0 to 32 output pins, 0 to 5 set pins, and 0 to 5 side sets pins. The pins are contiguous starting from the base addresses for each pin type, and all can be different for each state machine. In addition, the pin assignments can overlap. 
Note that the state machines assume there are 32 pin locations even though there are actually only 30 physical pins. Each state machine also has three 32-bit registers, the program counter and two scratch registers called, get ready for it, X and Y. Also, each state machine can interact with the interrupt structure of the Pico. There's a lot more PIO theory that I haven't covered. I'll put a link to a good theory video in the description below. However, I find that I learn better by using examples. So let's try writing our first PIO code. I'm first going to program the PIO in MicroPython to output an 8-bit binary word in parallel to 8 GPIO pins. First, I import the various libraries. In this case, we'll import pin routines from the machine library, the PIO, state machine, and ASM underscore PIO routines from the RP2 library, and the sleep routine from the time library. Next is the actual PIO program. This block is started off with a PIO underscore ASM decorator to tell MicroPython that a PIO program follows. Inside this decorator are several configuration statements. The out init configuration reserves eight contiguous output ports whose initial state will be high. The out shift direction mode defines which direction the 32-bit output shift register will shift data into the outputs. In this case, a right shift will output the eight least significant bits. Had we selected a left shift, we would have output the eight most significant bits. The auto pull mode defines whether to automatically refill the output shift register from the transmit FIFO. If true, it will auto fill in parallel with whatever the state machine is doing. If false, the program will have to specifically control the pull instructions. Pull threshold tells auto pull when to refill the output shift register. In this case, when the output shift register reaches 16 bits, it'll be refilled again from the transmit FIFO. Next is the actual program definition. In this case, I named it parallel underscore prog. This is a very simple program. First, we pull data from the transmit FIFO, then we output the eight least significant bits to the GPIO pins. By default, the pull instruction has the block parameter enabled. This means that if the transmit FIFO is empty, the PIO program will stall and wait for the main program to send more data to it. That's what we want in this case. If the no block parameter had been enabled, the program would have continued to run and the last data that was in the transmit FIFO would continue to be recycled. The out instruction specifies where we want to send the data from the output shift register and how many bits we want to shift out. We can send data to the pins, the X, Y, or program counter registers, the input shift register, or to the pin direction register. You can also discard the data or treat it like an instruction and execute it directly. This time we're sending the data to the GPIO pins. That's the end of the PIO program. It will continue to loop forever as long as the main program is executing. You might be wondering which GPIO pins will be used. The base pin of the GPIO and the frequency of the PIO program are specified in the state machine constructor. We're assigning the name of the state machine as parallel underscore SM. The statement starts with the number of the state machine. Remember, there can be a total of eight. In this case, we're only using one, so we'll use number zero. Next is the name of the program we'll be running on this state machine. In this case, parallel underscore prog. Next, we'll define the clock frequency for the program. In this case, we're using 10 megahertz. The program will execute one instruction for every clock cycle. The default of the Raspberry Pi is 125 megahertz. For timing critical application, such as serial communications, this can be set to a wide range of frequencies. Finally is the base pin definition. I have this demonstration wired to LEDs on contiguous GPIO pins starting at GPIO 0, that is, GPIO pins 0 through 7. The out base sets the lowest pin 
of the group of output pins. If needed, there are similar definitions to set the lowest pins of the set, side set, and input pins. The process of defining the state machine is called instantiation. Note that we can have three more state machines running the exact same program as this one, using the same or different pins and frequencies. Now we need to start our state machine. Using a 1 in this statement will start the state machine. Using a 0 will stop it. Finally, we get to the main loop. In this case, we count up to 500 while sending the result to the transmit FIFO using the put I statement. Finally, I've added a print statement and a sleep statement to slow it down so we can see the execution on camera. Okay, let's try this out. I'll start with a sleep period of 1 one hundredth of a second. As you can see, the byte output and the monitor outputs match. Success! Next, let's see how fast this will go. I've disabled the print and sleep statements. At least visually, it looks very fast. I'm really impressed by the PIO function of the Pico. I want to do a deeper dive into data flow control, but this video is getting a little long, so I think I'll end it here for now. Thanks for joining me today. We successfully programmed an 8-bit parallel port using the programmable input-output features of the Raspberry Pi Pico. I'm really excited to utilize this function for the low-capacity storage solution for my 6502 computer. Next time, I'll dig deeper into the capabilities of the PIO and state machines, so stay tuned. If you liked this video, or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video have, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon! The process of defining the state machine is called instant